Hi, today we're going to be talking about a form of interstitial lung disease known as hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Now, first we'd like to talk about what exactly um, the patient is hypersensitive to and what exactly hypersensitivity pneumonitis is. So let's imagine for the purpose of argument that the patient has a bird. So let's imagine there's a bird in the house and this bird um, has a lot of this dander, this bird dander that's all over the house. And you know, there are many, many people in the house, maybe, you know, four or five people, and nobody is, has trouble from having this bird in the house, except for this one person, this one lady um, seems to have problems. Now, what happens is that whenever the bird is in the house or, or the ladies in the house where the bird is, uh, she seems to get short of breath and she seems to develop a cough. Um, and whenever the bird is not in the house or if the lady leaves the house and goes on vacation, she seems to get better. Now, what's happening here is she is developing hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So this stuff that's coming out from the bird's feathers, this dander, is going into her lungs and way down into the interstitium. So if you think of these air sacs in the lung or the alveoli, and these are the walls of the alveoli or alveolar septa, then this little dander is going into the alveoli and all the other people in the family are fine because they are not hypersensitive to this particular form of organic antigen. But this lady is hypersensitive. So what's happening with her is instead of um, you know, just basically breathing it in and breathing it out, she is developing a cellular reaction to this um, to this antigen in the walls of her alveolar sacs or in the alveolar septa. So she is developing interstitial pneumonitis in response to this organic antigen, and that is called hypersensitivity pneumonitis. You're hypersensitive to this organic antigen, not to the poor bird per se, but hypersensitive to the organic antigen. And the pneumonitis part comes from here, is that there's an inflammation within the lung, specifically within the interstitium of the lung. So that's where the name hypersensitivity pneumonitis comes from. Now it goes by several names. That's what, what's confusing is because you could give it the umbrella term hypersensitivity pneumonitis, and that's what I'll be doing. But because there's so many different forms of antigens that can lead to the same kind of disease, there are several, you know, colorful names uh, for this disease. For example, there's a, an entity named farmer's lung. So that's a thing that farmers get because they, they are hypersensitive um, to bacteria that are present in moldy hay. And again, not all farmers get it. Um, you know, there, there are lots of farmers exposed to moldy hay, but only a few of them are hypersensitive. Similarly, there's a thing called bird fancier's lung. And so, for, for example, many people have pets in their home. Uh, you know, they have macaws and, and budgerigars and cockatiels and parakeets. These are the ones that are notorious for hypersensitive pneumonitis. But not all people that have these birds get hypersensitive. Only a few of them are. Um, so they're, they're called, um, uh, the, the disease in these patients is called bird fancier's lung. But it is a form of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Again, the common theme in both these um, diseases is that there is an inhaled organic antigen. The inhaled organic antigen is really the key um, that unifies these various um, uh, syndromes. And typically, as I mentioned, the patient has dyspnea or cough, and very importantly, almost all of them are never smokers. Now, it, it you can have hypersensitivity pneumonitis in smokers, but generally, the typical patient is a never smoker, has never smoked, and yet develops this kind of lung disease. Now, the source of antigen can be um, obvious. So, for example, if a farmer comes in with this with a typical history that they get short of breath when they go next to the hay and with, they get better when they get away from the farm, it might be pretty obvious that they have farmer's lung. On the other hand, the fact that somebody is coughing uh, and that might be related in somehow to their pet bird might not be obvious. So sometimes the source of antigen exposure is not obvious to the doctor who's seeing the patient. It's not even obvious to the patient. Um, so that history may or may not um, be volunteered or even sought. Uh, 
and sometimes the first person to suggest the diagnosis is the radiologist who sees the characteristic features on the uh, on a CT scan or sometimes the first person who suggests it might be the pathologist who sees the, the findings on a lung biopsy. So it might not be the typical sequence of the doctor making, you know, the primary doctor making the diagnosis. Now, this is what you see on a high resolution CT scan. So this is cut across transversely. So in this particular image, this is the left side and this is the right side of the body. Um, this is the front and this is the back. You can see the vertebral column is over here. So the lungs are here. This is the right lung and this is the left lung. And what's going on here is in these areas that I'm marking with the uh, with the purple is that the lung has an increased attenuation, meaning it's whiter than it should normally be. The normal lung is just black on a CT scan. It looks black. So these um, white areas are called ground glass opacities because it looks like ground glass like you see in a church. And of course, they are on both sides. So they are bilateral ground glass opacities and bilateral ground glass opacities are a key finding in hypersensitivity pneumonitis but there are many other diseases of the lung that can have the same finding so what's characteristic about this particular disease well one thing that's pretty striking is that there are also areas of low attenuation in other words they are a little more black um, compared to the whitish ground glass areas see that so that is called air trapping. Again, I'm not a radiologist, so I'm not an expert on this stuff. But my colleagues, um, you know, describe these findings a lot and, and I've learned from them over the years. So these areas are called air trapping. And these are increased areas of lower attenuation. And, that, and they are especially seen when the patient expires or, or blows air out, breathes air out. And then the combination of the high attenuation areas like this, and the low attenuation areas like this give what's known as a mosaic, M-O-S-A-I-C, a mosaic pattern to this chest CT, which is one of the characteristic findings of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And not only that, this patchy kind of appearance it has been likened to this material, which is actually called head cheese. It's, a, it's something to eat. But it's not cheese at all. It's actually it's a sort of a potpourri of, of various kinds of meats. But this head cheese appearance or the head cheese sign is quite characteristic radiologically um, of hypersensitivity pneumonitis, quite typical of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So if, if a radiologist, especially a, an experienced chest radiologist, sees this kind of a CT scan finding, uh, they will usually come up with the idea that this might be hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And then if you have the typical history, if you have a, a, a pet bird or the patient is a never smoker woman, um, then you can put it all together and, and probably come up with the diagnosis of hypersensitivity pneumonitis, maybe even without a, a confirmatory lung. But now we're going to talk about the meat of this uh, issue, which is the pathology what are the pathologic findings in hypersensitivity pneumonitis? And the one thing that I want you to take away from this lecture is that the main pathology is lymphocytes. You get lymphocytes within the alveolar receptor, within the interstitium, not eosinophils. And why I am stressing that, it, that eosinophils are not really the, um, the cell to worry about is usually when medical students are taught hypersensitivity, let's, let's say for example, they are taught hypersensitivity phenomenon, um, phenomena in the skin or in the respiratory tract. They are taught that when you are hypersensitive, eosinophils come into the affected tissue and that's a type one hypersensitivity phenomenon. But in hypersensitivity pneumonitis, eosinophils are not the cell of interest. They are not the cell of interest. They are not increased in the lung when you do a bronchoalveolar lavage, they are not found to be increased in number. It is lymphocytes that are the cell of interest. So I'm probably stressing it too much, but it really needs to be stressed because that is something that should not even enter your mind when you're talking about hypersensitivity pneumonitis of the lung. So let me show you a couple of HNE stained pictures of cases of hypersensitivity pneumonitis and what you see in there. So the most important thing is that you see within the alveolar septa or the interstitium, you see these collections of lymphocytes. So the interstitium or the alveolar septa is not normal, it's thick. 
and that's why this is a form of interstitial lung disease because the interstitium is predominantly involved. So there are these collections of lymphocytes within the alveolar septa that expand it. It's not very dramatic. It's very mild and fairly diffuse. It doesn't have a patchwork appearance. That means it's not like some is normal and some is abnormal. Um, you could see that it might be a slightly high, you know, more abnormal towards the bronchioles, but you can't really tell that in this particular picture. The other thing that you see in hypersensitivity pneumonitis is that you see an occasional giant cell, multinucleated giant cell, or you see an occasional poorly formed granuloma. And as you can see from this picture, it's not at all obvious that that, that finding is popping out. That finding is quite subtle. The finding of a giant cell or a granuloma can be very subtle in hypersensitivity pneumonitis, as opposed to, for example, sarcoidosis or, or even hot tub lung or infections, things where the granulomas are the predominant feature and really pops out as the main finding in a lung biopsy. In hypersensitivity pneumonitis, that's not at all the main finding. It's, it's very subtle and can be difficult to identify. In fact, if you look at low magnification, it looks like what's, what's known as cellular nonspecific interstitial pneumonia or cellul the cellular variant of NSIP because the whole lung is very diffusely, mildly inflamed and expanded by chronic inflammation. Like let's say here, uh, those alveolar septa, alveolar septa up here, they're all mildly abnormal. But the thing to look out for is the occasional giant cell or granuloma. And in this case, here it is. There's two multinucleated giant cells in that focus. And so that's a clue that this is not NSIP and that this is actually hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Um, there can be areas of the lung, especially at low magnification, where it, you just cannot see any giant cells or granulomas. And that's actually not at all uncommon in hypersensitivity pneumonitis, that wh wherever you look, you see lymphocytes, um, are predominant and giant cells or granulomas are rare. Um, I will mention that most people, when they see lymphocytes in the lung, they try to um, name it as if lymphocytes were part of the disease. And so they, they think of lymphoid interstitial pneumonia, LIP, or lymphocytic interstitial pneumoni pneumonitis, but that is not the correct diagnosis. Uh, the other thing that people think about, as I already mentioned, is the cellular variant of NSIP. And again, that would be a perfectly reasonable to thing to think with this picture that I'm showing here. But if you saw a granuloma or a giant cell, then that interpretation should change to hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Here's a high magnification uh, image of a um, bronchiole, a, a small bronchiole. And you can see that there are cilia up there. So this is really a small bronchiole in the periphery of the lung. And that bronchiole is inflamed. In other words, there is some uh, lymphoid inflammatory infiltrate with lymphocytes within the mucosa of the bronchiole. So this is a chronic bronchiolitis. And that's another feature of this disease is that the bronchioles are also inflamed or the interstitium of the bronchioles is inflamed in addition to the alveolar septa. And then you can see this small um, multinucleated giant cell or poorly formed granuloma, whatever you want to call it, that the red arrow is pointing to. And that combination is also uh, quite common in hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Now, you can get that combination in other things like infections, um, especially non-tubercular mycobacterial infections. But um, the kind of interstitial inflammation that you get in hypersensitivity pneumonitis is actually quite characteristic. So let's uh, back off here. Again, you see the main finding here is the expansion of the interstitium by lymphocytes. You also see another thing, which is a few foamy macrophages within the air spaces, the lumens of the alveoli. Um, and that's just a secondary finding, secondary to bronchiolar narrowing or obstruction. That is not the main pathology. Again, the red arrow here shows you the foamy macrophages, which is a secondary pathology. The green arrow shows you lymphocytes within the interstitium. And the white arrow points out a very large and prominent multinucleated giant cell. And what it has within it is a, um, an inclusion, a cholesterol cleft, which is an endogenous inclusion. In other words, the multinucleated giant cell itself makes that um, inclusion as a degeneration, you know, a, a, a byproduct, a degenerative sort of byproduct. It is not exogenous. In other words, you shouldn't be seeing that and thinking, 
hey, this giant cell is eating something up, the patient must have aspirated, must be injecting something. No, this is a very common endogenous inclusion and is quite common in hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Other kinds of inclusions like shaman bodies, sometimes asteroid bodies, uh, oxalate crystals, those are also fairly common within the giant cells of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Can be numerous in, at, at times. And then this is a finding called peribronchiolar metaplasia. In other words, what's happening here is that there is there would have a, um, a, a bronchovascular bundle. So let me try to show that here. There, I'm sorry, this keeps uh, changing. But at some point, there would have been a bronchiole and an artery in a bronchovascular bundle together. And from that kind of uh, pair, what we have ended up with here is these bronchiolar structures have grown out into the remainder of the lung. All these bronchiolar lined structures have grown out into the remainder of the lung and replaced the alveolar epithelium. So this is a kind of metaplasia that happens around the bronchioles and it takes the bronchiolar epithelium and replaces the alveolar epithelium. So it's a very similar to other kinds of metaplasias where one cell type is replaced by another cell type. And this is fairly common in hypersensitivity pneumonitis. It also happens in other things, for example, in, in usual interstitial pneumonia, but it, it is also common in hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So peribronchiolar metaplasia, some people call it lambertosis. Uh, that's uh, sort of an older name. So that's another finding in hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Here's a very high magnification image to show you that the cells in the alveolar septa are actually mostly lymphocytes, and that's what the circles are showing you here. Here's another picture that shows you a capillary over here, and then it shows you the alveolar septa here. This thing here is the airspace, and within the alveolar septa, you can see that there are several lymphocytes, and this is the hallmark of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Here's a plasma cell. Again, I want to stress and leave you with this idea that lymphocytes within the interstitium are the hallmark of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. This disease can be diagnosed also on transbronchial biopsies, although it can be a little difficult to do that. But in this particular biopsy, you are seeing a multinucleated giant cell with a couple of inclusions right in the middle and lymphocytes within the interstitium in the background. So it's certainly possible to do that. Now here is a, in contrast, a picture of sarcoidosis. So in sarcoidosis, the granulomas are much bigger and more prominent. So here, for example, there's a, there's a fairly big prominent granuloma, also in the interstitium like hypersensitivity pneumonitis, but big and prominent granulomas and the lung parenchyma away from the granulomas. In other words, where there is no granuloma, the lung parenchyma is fairly normal. It's not inflamed like in hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So that's the difference. Although these things um, sound similar, that there's granulomas in the interstitium in both diseases, actually the appearance is uh, quite dramatically different in most cases. Here's another picture of hypersensitivity pneumonitis in a transbronchial biopsy. And again, you can see lymphocytes within the interstitium and, and, and a multinucleated giant cell over here. And before we finish, just a word on treatment. Obviously, if you know that there is a source of exposure, if, you, if there's a bird, for example, in the house, the best thing is to get the patient away from the bird or get the bird away from the patient and seize the exposure. That's the ideal treatment. But in many patients, we, we are actually unable to find what the source of exposure is or it's not that obvious. In those patients, um, they need corticosteroids and uh, the response to therapy is actually pretty good. So the prognosis is that most of them recover after exposure stops. Now, if exposure comes back, so if the you know patient goes back to another environment where the bird was, they can relapse and again get sick. But as long as the exposure stops, most patients recover from this disease. Um, those um, that need corticosteroids also improve. Many of them improve uh, after corticosteroid therapy. So this is actually one of an example of an interstitial lung disease where therapy can be very, very effective um, and, tre and treatment can be effective. Unfortunately, some patients, especially the ones where you can't figure out an antigen and where corticosteroids haven't worked, those can progress to fibrosis in the long term and give rise to a, 
a condition known as chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So I uh, hope that you will remember that hypersensitivity pneumonitis in the lung is a treatable form of interstitial lung disease and is characterized by the presence of lymphocytes within the interstitium. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Thank you.